next uh, speaker will be Yedid uh, Choshen, who is a senior lecturer uh, at the Hebrew University of uh, Jerusalem. He was, uh, before that, he was a research scientist at uh, Facebook AI uh, Research. He completed his PhD from uh, the Hebrew University under supervision of Professor Shmuel uh, Peleg. And he also has master's uh, degree in physics from the is University it, of it? Oxford. Okay, okay. Uh, yes. thank you for the introduction. So I'm going to talk about anomaly detection, and I should mention that this work is by the uh, student uh, Leron Bergman. So anomaly detection is about identifying unusual patterns. Um, and uh, let's just uh, talk about a few applications. So say we are a credit card company and we process a lot of transactions, and we obviously um, want to see if something which is not normal is going on. Right. So this is an anomaly detection task or we are some sort of cybersecurity company, we process a lot of files, and we want to see whether a specific file doesn't behave quite normally. Right? This is anomaly detection again. Again, for medical diagnosis, we look at um, some sort of medical samples, and we want to see whether the body is behaving normally or if something else happens. Right? An anomaly detection again. It's a fairly general problem, fairly general setting, and it's quite interesting. So there's a few um, different training settings that anomaly detection um, is sort of I is trained on. So the um, maybe the most difficult one is unsupervised. That we have a training set with some normal samples and some anomalous samples, and we don't know which one's which, right? So this is quite tricky. I usually, they make the assumption that only a small proportion of the data is anomalous, but still, this is uh, fairly tricky. The most, um, probably the easier setting is the supervised setting, and that's when we know exactly what the anomalies look like, right? So we have some examples of anomalies, we have some examples of normal data, we train our favorite classifier to, train to classify data into normal and anomalous, right? So this isn't really quite normal anomaly detection, because generally the idea behind anomaly detection is that we don't know what we're looking for. The setting that we're going to be mainly dealing with is the semi-supervised setting in which we have a training set may just consisting of normal data and no anomalous data. Right, so this is usually not too difficult to get and, um, I, and is interesting enough um, to learn some fairly powerful anomaly detectors. So there's a few standard anomaly detection paradigms. So I if we have full supervision, which, as we said, is somewhat cheating and is not looking for the thing that we actually care about, um, then you can use classification-based methods. Um, and there are some practical settings, though, in which this is what you want to do. And if you have supervision, then you should use it. right? But um, assuming that we only have uh, semi-supervision at best, then we can, uh, so I guess the standard paradigms would be reconstruction-based methods, which I would imagine near, uh, nearest neighbors or, um, or k-means would be under this. But right now with deep learning, people would use autoencoders. And we would have probabilistic methods, which would try to pro build a probabilistic model for what the normal data looks like. And then if a new sample comes in and has a low probability, we would classify it as anomalous. So these type of methods are OK, but generally the accuracies are not that great. And so we kind of need new ideas. So uh, one direction which is quite interesting is self-supervised learning. Uh, we've already talked about um, deep learning and the fact that it's really useful when we have a lot of supervision, for example, image classification. Now, the key strengths of deep learning, um, in my mind, is not necessarily just the fact that it's really good at um, function approximation, but it's also the fact that it learns really strong representations. So it takes really complicated data, like images, which the representation is fairly uninformative unless you actually know what's going on in the image, and it, condense in it, it condenses it into a much lower dimensional and much more informative representation, which you can do nearest neighbors, train a very shallow classifier, and so on. So we, we get this strong representation by using supervision, usually, for example, having a million labeled images. The question is, though, can we learn this really powerful representation with cheap supervision? And this is self-supervised learning. There's a lot of work being done in this because having good representation is important. So I'm just going to talk about one work in this field, Rotnet. It was published in iClear18 by some other team. 
And it's, it's a really simple idea. The idea is that you take every training sample and you rotate it, so we're just talking about the images, and you rotate it in four different rotation angles, right? Zero, 90, and so on. And now we train a classifier to t take the uh, rotated image and classify which image, uh, which rotation angle it was rotated by. Was it rotated by zero, 90, 180, and so on, right? So we can take a completely unsupervised training set, which we assume all the images are upright, rotate it in every single angle, and then train a classifier now that we have fake supervision from transformed image to the transformation label. We would train a deep classifier for one end to the other one, and the representation learned turns out to be very powerful, ne nearly as powerful as using fully supervised data. So I'm just going to mention one more work, because it's highly related. So this work is by Golan and Elianiv, it was um, published in uh, NIPS, uh, NeuroIPS uh, just six months ago. And the, the idea is that you do pretty much the same thing. You slightly extend the uh, set of rotation angles. Uh, so you also use flips and small translations. And the idea is that you train this network using, as we said, this kind of fake transformed supervision um, on your training data, which consists of just the um, normal data. For example, this could be the digit one from MNIST. Then at, at test time, we would transform the test data using those 72 different transformations and try to classify the um, transformed data into the transformation label, one, uh, one from 72. And um, basically by testing how good the classifier is, this tells us how normal or anomalous is the, the data is. Um, so why is that? The idea is that, uh, that's generally true in machine learning, if you train a machine li learning classifier on one distribution, then at test time, if the test data comes from similar distribution to the trained data, then the classifier would generalize well, and if it's different, then it wouldn't. So assuming that anomalous, that normal data comes from similar distribution to the training set, the classifier would be successful on it, and if the um, test data is anomalous, the distribution is different, so it would not. So low classification score means anomalous data. So this, these kinds of geometric methods have serious limitations. They're really handcrafted for images. They use um, specific image processing transformations. And they, um, they assume a, th they kind of like have to handcraft the transformation, so it's a fixed number. They're unsuitable for new tasks and domains because you kind of have to handcraft your transformations. And they are fairly unsuitable, that unsuitable for tabular data because they use image processing transformations. So we present a new method which is able to do anomaly detection on general data which um, involves, we can get an infinite number of transformations because our transformations are random, we're going to show what they do exactly. It works for tabular data as well, which means data consisting of categor categorical and numerical data, which is usually the kind of data that I would imagine most data scientists usually deal with. And we make very few, or I think no assumptions, on the task domain. So let's see exactly what we do. So we come up with a couple of sets of um, random operations. And this is mostly suitable for tabular data, but you can apply it on other things. So the simplest set is just a random permutation. So you take your vector and you randomly permute it using a fixed permutation. Now, obviously, we can, given a um, Given n dimensions, we can get n factorial permutations, so we can get a lot of different permutations, and each one of these permutations is a transformation that we use. Right? So we, we take the input, we transform it using this transformation. This gives us one transformed instance of the input. I'll, I'll show examples. Um, the, mo so the most um, effective transformation class that we come up with is um, random affine transformations. And this is maybe a complex name, but all it means is that we just randomly sample matrices, just from a simple normal distribution. And we use this random matrix as our transformation. So we take this random matrix, we multiply it by the actual original sample, and this gives us one tr transformed instance of the input. Now, if we do it for multiple matrices, we can get multiple transformed instances for the same sample. And so now we have a fake supervised data set of transformation label and transformed data. So let's just show that a little bit more clearly. So we first sample L transformations from one of the classes shown before. 
Now, each data point, x in the training set, is now transformed into all different labeled pairs, right? So we take it, we transform it, and so we have transform data and label, transform data and label, right? So now each example gave us all different labeled pairs. And, okay, so this is now our training set. Right now we have a very extended training set. And now we train a classifier, which could be as deep as you want, to go from the transformed image to the transformation label. So this is, I, I guess it's similar training to before, and we train it using cross-entropy, which is fairly standard. Okay, so now we have a trained classifier that can give us a transform data point and can tell us what the transformation level is. This task by itself is not particularly interesting, of course, um, but the interesting thing is that we can take test data, which might be normal or might be anonymous. The training data was only normal. Um, so for this test data, we transform it in uh, using those all different transformations, and we classify each one of them. Okay, now if we measure the probabilities that the network predicts of, uh, of, the, um, of classifying the correct transformation, and we basically sum them up. I mean, we, don't sum, we multiply them, we take logs though, so it becomes a sum. Now, so this gives us the anomaly score, and basically the more anomalous the data is, the lower the probability that we'll get the correct transformation, and the more normal the data is, the higher the probability is of getting the correct transformation. So high score means anomalous, low score means normal. Okay, so in terms of implementation, this is really trivial. We use really simple classifiers, just fully connected network, 128 uh, hidden nodes in each layer. We play around with a number of hidden layers, but if we don't say otherwise, we just use two hidden layers. So these are tiny little networks, and we just optimize using SGD. So we performed a couple of experiments just to uh, verify. These are fairly standard benchmarks, and it's against sort of state-of-the-art anomaly detection methods, and most of them use deep learning. So the two, we have two medical data sets, Arrhythmia and Thyroid, which are fairly small data sets, and we have a much larger data set, um, which is called kdd -Cup. These are two variants of it taken from previous literature, and this is on more sort of like cyber intrusion, that sort of thing. We evaluate the various transformations that we propose just to see which one is most effective. So let's see some results. These are the results on the two medical data sets. And we can see that our, our three different transformation classes, it doesn't really matter which one you use, all of them are highly effective. It seems like the affine method, the random matrix method is the most effective one. So even ar arrhythmia, which is a tiny little data set, we perform um, we performed better than the best um, baseline. Um, on, on the thyroid data set, um, we do about 25% uh, better than the best baseline, so we're obviously doing a lot, a lot better. Um, the reason why the F1 scores are sometimes lower than 50% is the proportion of anomalies is significantly lower than 50%, right? So you don't need to expect it to be above 50%. And on the KDD cup data set, which is more of a sort of cyber intrusion data set, you can see that we perform significantly better than the next um, best method. Um, and this is for the, for the two scenarios. So we did some analysis of our method. First of all, we said that we can get pretty much as many um, transformations as we want. So let's see how many, let's see how the number of transformations actually affects the performance. So we varied the number of random transformations, and we did that over several ones, and we measured the variance, and you can see that up to 16 transformations, um, we can, basically the more transformations you have, the better the accuracy. Um, but above 16 transformations, the accuracy sort of saturates, but then the variance reduces, right? So the more transformations you have, the less variance you have in the classifier, so that's good but the runtime increases, right? So you probably want to have more than 16, but between 16 and infinity, it's a question of variance versus runtime. You know, do your own trade-offs. Um, in terms of the number of layers, so this really tends to be a function of the data set. Um, these anomaly detection data sets are mostly quite small, unfortunately. So for the tiny data sets, actually a linear clas classifier was pretty much the best because it's just overfit. On medium data sets, such as KDD-REV, um, 
a small number of hidden layers, one, two, three hidden layers, they make a massive difference, but more than that tended to overfit. And on large data sets like the full KDD, we found that deepest um, classifiers perform the best. So if you have a lot of data, you can use very deep networks. If you don't, you need to regularize it somehow. In th so we said that our method is specialized to, um, to semi-supervised anomaly detection when we have a training set that only has normal data. So we, we tested how sensitive it is to the unsupervised scenario in which we also have some anomalies in the training set. And we found that to a, small, to a small percentage of anomalous data, it still kind of worked. And it, it did so better than baseline methods. So we're not that sensitive to not having any anomalies in the training set. But obviously, if you can ha have no anomalies in the training set, then you would do much better. Um, so this is it, just to summarize. So we um, presented a novel method for anomaly detection for general data. Our method requires virtually no domain knowledge, so should probably be quite good for sort of general data science uh, use cases. Th it, I guess it has a fairly significant improvement over state-of-the-art techniques, and it's really simple. And it can handle some unsupervised settings, so it doesn't just break. Um, so thank you very much. Hi. How can you make sure that when you're doing the transformations on the normal data, it's not suddenly becoming anomaly? It's possible, but I think it's pretty unlikely. Um, and also you're transforming the anomalous data in a similar way. So even if it was previously anomalous, uh, it, it maybe if you know it would be similar to previous anomalous data after the transformation, it probably wouldn't be. But I, I think this transformation class doesn't make it look like anomalous data. Um, but if you happen to be in a scenario in which it did, then that would be unfortunate. But generally, it doesn't seem to happen too much. One more question, please. I think it's not surprising that you had much better results on the cyber, cyber data set because in medical data, there is no such thing as anomalous. Like people who are healthy already have sometimes in them the anomalous and it's just not manifest yet. And also doctors do not agree. So I would expect this to be really effective for man-made constructs. So cyber is one. Have you considered NLP? That would seem a natural area to detect, for example, different kinds of documents, anomalous documents, anomalous sentences. So we've, it, it sounds like a great idea. Uh, we have considered many things, but have only tried it on the data sets that we've shown. So there's obviously a lot of opportunities. Um, I'm really excited about this. I think that this should be applied to a lot of things, and I, I'm very optimistic that it would work. Um, the only things that we tried it on are pretty much what we've shown. So you know, it can probably work on a lot more things. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, thank the speaker again.